in light of these results that have taken place at the first day, obviously, of MLG X Games Aspen, where Kaboom was able to shock Cloud9, they were able to stomp them 16 to 4 Mirage. Well, the main name that is known by Westerners, known by players in North America, Europe, etc., in terms of CS, is Fallen. We don't really know the other players, but actually Fallen has a pedigree, a tenure that goes back in a 1.6, and he was a famous, a great player. So I thought I'd introduce people to who he is as a player, because he's obviously it's a, to it's a topical issue right now. First of all, to understand the context of Fallen, you have to know when he came up as a player. So it was late 2009 was the era when, within Brazil, he was like around the second best teams, he was battling. MIBR, basically there was a split took place in the team. Kogu, who was the always the, the greatest player ever from Brazil, one of the greatest, one of the top 10 players of all time in CS, individually, an amazing player. He, he was in this position where he was in with the owner of MIBR, the best Brazilian team that in 2006 had won the world championship. And basically that guy sort of decided like, mm, I'm gonna stick with Kogu like over any other player and I'm gonna decide like which players get to play with them based on what Kogu says. So Kogu wanted a particular player brought back at the time. Some of the other players didn't want them brought back. I think it was Kiku at the time he wanted brought back one of his old teammates. And so a bunch of the rest of the players kind of like fractured off. And it was the end of 2008, early 2009 when this happened. And they went off and they formed what later became Fire Gamers and, and Fallen would be a player that they'd start to play with. Now, here's the thing. Kogu really was just by far the best Brazilian player ever. And he, like I said, he won the top 10 players of all time in CS. He had an amazing AWP. I think he's the best AWP ever. He had a super consistent style. The best way to describe Kogu is he just never missed. That was the way we thought of him. He had the most insane hit rate ever. He could just trail the shot and track it so that he would only fire it when it was going to hit. And so there was other teams like the Finns, the guys at Lurpus and Na his brother Nasu and those guys who were very skilled players. They used to even say, if you played MIBR, if you just kill Kogu, you've won the round. If you don't, you might lose the round. You might lose the game. And so certain maps, Dust 2, obviously on train, he was just a nightmare on CT sides. And you would actually have to base your whole game around trying to neutralize him or go away from him or make him be rotating. And not only that, he wasn't just the best AWPer. He had amazing rifles for an AWPer. He had really, really good spray. And then on top of that, he had very good pistols. He was just one of the best players. He wasn't just one of the best AWPers. He was one of the best players. So knowing that context, that Brazil produces the one genius. Beyond him, they had a couple of good players. Like FNX would be like a good streaky rifler sometimes. He wasn't a god. He wasn't a great player like Kogu. He was a good player. Then they had some good support players. They had like a good entry fragger, like Bruno was a good entry fragger. They had good mid-round players. They had some good players. They had an okay strat call a bit, one. But they never had great players like this. They had one godlike player. So you're thinking to yourself, okay, they had one godlike player and then circumstances align or collude so that he can't play with the rest of his teammates who were great players with him you'd think okay the Brazilian scene is going to die off now you can't replace talent like that and eventually Kogo actually retired like a year or so later no what happens is amazingly enough a player comes up as a rising talent who basically was as close to Kogu as you could ever get in play style skill set and even like the role that he used in the team it was like a Kogu is Kogu 2.0 this guy came along, he had amazing orping. Now his style wasn't the same, it wasn't that super consistent tracking style. It was more like quick flick shots, but he was really skilled with it. He, he, he was definitely one of the best players in the world. He wasn't quite to the level of Kogu, and he crucially, here's his problem. His timing of when he came along meant that he, he would have never been able to be as great as Kogu, because it wasn't just the skills or the game impact with Kogu who, who could dominate the game. It's that the era when Kogu came around and became great was like 2004 going through to, let's say 2008 is the end. So let's say his, his prime is really like 2004 to say 2007. <clears throat> in this era, not only is Kogu amazing, one of the top five players in the world probably, but he gets the right teams around him. First of all, he's supported by MIBR as an organization. And because they were backed by a guy who's a millionaire, he used to actually, he knew there was no proper practice in Brazil and you were never going to be great as a Brazilian team. So he would fly his teams out and book them in for a week boot camp in Inferno Online before the big tournaments, before like an ESWC type tournament or before a DreamHack or whatever else. And that's why MIBR was able to get proper practice and with the right teams, with the MIBR teams, with with, with Knack and FNX, crucially he was the second star, and then Bruno, and later on they had Bit. That's why these players were able to have really good results. So they won ESWC 2006, a major tournament. They were world champions. They were able to come top four at ESWC 2007 without 
Kogu later on. Actually, they'd even have some good results. They like finished high in some dream hacks with Kogu in in ESWC. No, in Game Goon two thousand and seven, they had a really sick run. They finished second to Fnatic. They were really awesome there. He had, he had a great tournament. So it wasn't just Kogu was a great player, which he was. He was one of the greatest. But then also he had the right team. He had the right organization. He was in the right era of when you could travel like this. It wasn't the same way for Fallen. He had the great skills, but he wouldn't get many chances. He'd get like he'd go to a WCG. He'd go to an ESWC. He never really had big results in the big tournaments. He finished like top eight at an ESWC, but that was it. There was nothing beyond that. In terms of actual results, the only real meaningful results to talk about were he won three WCG Pan Am championships in a row. Now the Pan Am, okay, WCG was like the Olympics of gaming. It's all countries combined. Pan Am was where it was just American countries. So you had like, as in the two American continents. So you had like, yeah, you had America, obviously, North America, technically. You had Brazil, you had Mexico represented, you had Chile, you sometimes had Peru. You had all these different parts and they'd battle out for, for medals, like gold medal, silver medal, bronze medal. Here's what's interesting. Over these three years when Fallen played, he won the gold medal every year and North America won the silver medal or below. <clears throat> and so every single time, the first two years, I think it was 2009, 2010, he played against evil geniuses. Now, admittedly, they didn't have Lopez in the lab because he, he wasn't eligible to play because he came from Finland and he was their in-game leader and he, he was a lot of their team. But listen, they still had fraud. They still had nothing. They still had these star players. And despite that, Fallen almost single-handedly. I'll admit, there was one game I remember on Nuke where Bruno was particularly good, but almost single-handedly, he was the best player on the server. Fallen just bodied in these tournaments was really, really good. And he pretty much single-handedly beat a team that in theory is better than him, had more skill, etc. twice in a row. Then the third year, admittedly, that was the year where like UMX went, who weren't particularly good. They were just like an okay level American, North American team, like maybe like the fourth best sort of team in invite, and they just bodied them fairly easily. So these were the only times we ever got to see him really just go nuts. Otherwise, he would be a guy where he was like an individual star doing well in certain games, but his team wasn't up to snuff and they weren't ever going to win a big tournament, if we're fair. He, he wasn't born, born, as a, born as a player, born as a top level player in, in the right era for him. Because actually, if you were from Brazil, like I'm describing here, a lot of the players, they either weren't good enough or then they didn't have the right team or then they didn't have the right teammates because a lot of his players now, he had the same, same teammates as Kogu, like I described. But this is when they were all at the end of their careers. They were in their peak and they knew they weren't going to go to as many tournaments and they knew they were never, get, crucially, they could never get back on MIBR. They were always outside of MIBR. They were on the Fire Gamers. Then they were in Complexity briefly. They never had that same support. They couldn't go for those weeks at a time to Inferno Online and Bootcamp. It just wasn't going to happen the same way. So they never had all the things you needed to be able to potentially shine that way. So he wasn't quite as good as a Kogu. And he didn't have the tenure. Kogu, crucially, had years and years. He had like four or five years where he really was his godlike opera. Fallen had a couple where he was a great talent. He had a lot of skill. Now, interesting also, when CS 1.6 started to die out a bit, especially for Brazilians, he actually switched to Source for a little while and he made this really bizarre statement where he said that he actually thought Source was more tactical than CS 1.6. Bearing in mind, CS 1.6 is probably... But I think it's by far the most tactical of all the CS games. I'd actually love to see if there's an interview where he really break, broke that down because it was quite the interview I saw about it. He just gave quite a simple comment. He never really went into any detail. I know that in the latter days, in CS:GO days, yeah, he was playing with this team now, Kaboom, and then they actually merged with Pro Gaming TD, which was actually the team that Kogu briefly came back with. And I know that he was giving lessons, CS lessons. This was a big part of his thing. Obviously, he's been playing in CSGO. We haven't seen Kaboom most places. We saw him at ESWC where they did fairly mm -hmm. badly in the group stage. So overall, we haven't really gotten to see much from them. Also, in CSGO, he hasn't been a great all player. He's never really flourished in the same way he was in 1.6 as an individual talent. That's just never been the case. But there was a period in time, 2009, 2010, 2011, when if things had been differently, he really is one of those cases where it's a what if story. I wonder what could have been the case. I actually sometimes wonder in scenarios like that. I always used to wish back in those days of 1.6, it never happened. For scenarios like we see now in like professional League of Legends, where if someone really is talented, people from other regions where there's a lot of money to be made, like LCS, EU or NA, they're willing to import players that are really good. I always wondered what could have happened if you could have imported a Fallen to Europe and just put him in an all pink box. He spoke English. Or if you could have imported, obviously, Kogu, that would be a wonderful one. If Neo could have gone from the Polish teams when some of them had downtime, if he could have gone to some great team like SK Gaming, imagine what could have been possible. And some of these moves, by the way, behind the scenes were sometimes tried or really were thought about. They just never went through them because it wasn't really done back then. It, there wasn't the same amount of money and infrastructure. So Fallen's really a what-if player, but I, I, he'll always be someone where 
I'm curious to watch him play because I'm interested. Like, can he ever get back to that level? Could he have that impact with the AWP? Probably not at the moment, but it, he was an, an interesting tease in CS history. Let's just put it that way.